What is up everybody? Welcome back to part 15 of my Ken Kratz book review. The case against Stephen Avery and what making a murderer gets wrong. The series where I go over Ken Kratz's book, compare it to what we've learned in the Making a Murderer documentary, and what has come out since. Now just because I'm reviewing Ken Kratz's book does not mean I believe everything he states in this book to be true, I just think it's a great way to share his narrative compared to other things we have learned. He states that making a murderer was misleading, had deceptive editing, crucial fact omissions, personal attacks, and a willingness to accuse innocent people of criminal wrongdoing. Or they could have just been filming and airing and editing what they saw. That could have been what was going on as well. States Kathleen Zellner has impossible theories and makes bold pronouncements. Calls Dassey's lawyer, Brendan Dassey's lawyer, Laura Nyrider, who I think is absolutely fantastic, a highly competent attorney. He starts out this chapter by talking about the blood. States there was no blood on the steering wheel because it could have been wiped clean by Stephen Avery. Now, the problem I have with that statement was it, they did find blood, allegedly, allegedly, of Stephen Avery's in this car that was left there by him. If he was cleaning stuff, if he was smart enough to clear the steering wheel, why didn't he look around and have cleaned it all? He clearly had time because the car was not found for days later. He had lots of time to go back, clean it, or even crush it. You know, if the car was actually on the lot when any of this stuff happened. He states that Kathleen Zellner boldly states that a hammer must have been used in the killing of Teresa Halbach, but then he talks about how she talks about the hammer being used as if it was an uncontested fact. Which was strange to me because they have said many times that she was shot. Are you saying that it's possible that she wasn't shot, that she was killed with the hammer because it's an uncontested fact? It states many times in this book and in this chapter about how the filmmakers of Making a Murderer edited the documentary to fit their narrative, which is the exact same thing Ken Kratz did with his book. He's accusing the filmmakers of doing the same thing that he did in his book. And not that there's anything wrong with either, but you're going to tell the story you see from your point of view. They're telling the Making a Murderer documentary series as they saw it, as they see it. And Ken Kratz is writing his book, telling his narrative on what he thinks happened. He talks about the key and the hood latch. Talks about everything we already know from both seasons of Making a Murderer. Doesn't really provide anything new, but not surprisingly does not address that there was still zero DNA found from Teresa Halbach on her key. You know, the key to the car that she owned and used every day. And they didn't find one speck of her DNA on it. Not even a mixture of Stephen Avery's DNA with Teresa Hallbach's DNA, nothing. That talks about the bones. Uh, doesn't really, again, doesn't really state anything new, but he does state that Stephen Avery mutilated the bones as they were being burned. Now, unless I'm mistaken, Stephen Avery was found not guilty of mutilating the body. So he either forgot that or doesn't, or he's going against the court findings himself here to fit his narrative. Which is strange because he was found not guilty of mutilating the body, but he states he believes Stephen Avery mutilated the body. So he's going against the court in his own mind, to fit his narrative of the book. Allegedly. Ken Kratz states it was not his obligation to present identical theories as to how Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery committed the crime in each of their trials. Now, this is from Ken Kratz's book. He states 
that if he told Stephen Avery's jury that Brendan Dassey confessed to watching Stephen Avery kill and mutilate it, again, he was found not guilty of mutilating the body, confessed to watching Stephen Avery kill and mutilate Teresa Halbach, the result would have been a mistrial and likely an ethics complaint for presenting evidence that had been ordered excluded from Stephen Avery's trial. Now, I agree with Ken Kratz in this particular statement, not because of why you may think, but because of how, that's, this is true, because of how ridiculous the laws are in that particular area. You would think, in theory, Ken Kratz obviously thinks Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey committed this, committed this crime and committed this crime together. That's not a shocker. I'm not throwing any new information out there. He thinks that they did this together. So their stories should 100% match because they convicted Stephen Avery and got a lot of the ev evidence from Brendan Dassey's coerced statement from police. I still 1000% believe no matter what you believe, that that statement is coerced and absolutely ridiculous. So they got a lot of the information from Brendan Dassey. If both of those crime, if both of those people were at those crimes doing the same thing at the same time, why wouldn't you be able to present the exact same case in court to convict both people? But the laws of the state don't allow that. So they had to change the way they prosecuted Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery so that they could get a conviction on both men. Because if they did it the way you would think it should be done, one of them wouldn't have been set, sent to prison. In this particular scenario, most likely Brendan Dassey. It's a really weird way that you have to conduct law in the state of Wisconsin. Ken Kratz goes on to talk about the bullet, states that Kathleen Zellner says the red paint that was found on the bullet came through the garage wall. He believes it came from being ricocheted off a red toolbox found inside the garage. He goes on to talk about the brain fingerprinting test that was done, states that the test, when being read by the inventor of the test, Dr. Larry Farwell, is more art than science, meaning in his mind, Dr. Farwell can make up the results of this test and to fit whatever narrative he wants to fit. If he says, oh look, these lines mean this thing for one person and these lines mean this thing for another person, since he's the inventor of the test and the one reading the test, he can say whatever he wants uh, about the results. Uh, he talks, Ken Kratz talks about the Dassey computer states that even if the original trial lawyers, Dean Strang and Jerry Buting, attempted to put the CD into evidence, the court would have found the evidence inadmissible because in Wisconsin, again, another weird state rule, uh, because in Wisconsin, rules of evidence properly exclude irrelevant, especially evidence taking place months after the crime itself. I have no idea why this CD would be ruled irrelevant, my opinion. Again, Netflix degree of law, <laughs> my, uh, my opinion, CD, very relevant. And he's saying that once again, it was the rules of the court or the rules of the state that the CD was never included. It's pretty lucky there. Uh, talks about the coroner states that the coroner was not a witness because she was kept off the property like most other Manitowoc employees. You know, except the people that found the key. How can Ken Kratz state in his book that most other Manitowoc County employees were left off the property? And maybe they were. Maybe they were. Maybe there was only a couple that were allowed on the property. But the people that found the key, James Lank and Andrew Colburn, were Manitowoc employees and were not supposed to be searching. 
but they were searching anyway and found the key. But the coroner was not allowed on the property because she was a Manitowoc employee. That makes literally no sense. Whoever put this book together for Ken Kratz did not do him any favors. I know, like, in most of these situations, when someone like Ken Kratz is writing a book, he's not actually penning the book in most cases. He's sitting down with somebody else telling him his story, and that person is writing the book. You would think that just a couple chapters ago, you know, he's talking about how Stephen Avery is low IQ, not very intelligent, but then states he's a DNA expert. He became a DNA expert while sitting in prison for 18 years. States that people were kept off the property because they are Manitowoc County employees, but also talks about how Manitowoc employees found the key. I got, it's ridiculous. I don't, man, I'm sure this book was proofread before it went to press. Somebody missed something or they're intentionally doing it I don't understand why it would be done either way you would think someone would be like hey you said he was a genius and you also called him a moron because he's a DNA expert but also is stupid I don't I don't get it very weird very weird states that he was disappointed with his book writing experience he knows he didn't change the mind of anyone which is what he set out to do and a lot of that, I think, has to do with how this book was put together. I don't know if he's proud of this book. I've never heard him actually talk about the book. I don't know if he's happy with how it put together, happy with how the person that put the book together kind of makes him contradict himself in certain chapters. Again, by what I just said a moment ago, I don't know. But if you want to read the book to see... Uh, Ken Kratz narrative his thoughts It's available uh, On Amazon. I got it at chapters. It's a bookstore where I live So and this is actually the final chapter in the book. There's actually one more But it's more of a review of things and I don't need to review what I just reviewed So this is the final installment the case against Stephen Avery what making a murderer gets wrong Check it out if you want to Compare it like I did. I don't know. I have to finish the Making a Murderer Season 2 review as well. And I'm also going to pick up some more books about the Making a Murderer case and some other cases as well. I really hope you enjoyed this series. Thank you so much for taking your time out and watching it with me, going over it. You guys have blown me away with the amount of views, likes, comments, shares, and the support. I truly Truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hope everyone out there has a great day, and I'll see you again soon with another series. Have a great day, everybody.